Hello, everyone. It's Shane Lynn at MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History. Again, we're resuming our uh, series of virtual interviews. I have Tom Wing. He's Assistant Professor of History at the University of Arkansas at Fort Smith. He's also Director of the Drennan Scott Historic Site in Van Buren, which is also part of the UA Fort Smith system. Um, Tom is an educator in both the secondary and higher education. Uh, he's also a museum professional, been so for over 23 years. Um, I've worked with Tom when we were at Fort Smith National Historic Site. Uh, he's also a published author. He's been on the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, Smithsonian Channel, and PBS. He's also an award-winning historic preservationist. And I've asked him to join us because he's uh, got a book on a, a very interesting person regarding uh, the Civil War. And so, Tom, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I asked you to come on to talk about um, Private Henry Strong of the 12th uh, Kansas Infantry. Uh, uh, so tell us about him. Well, uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity, Shane. It's good to it's good to renew our acquaintance, and uh, we had some good times when we were park rangers together way back in earlier in our careers. And and uh, it's it's good to see you, and I appreciate the opportunity here. Um, Henry Strong, uh, literally, I, I've, I've been fortunate a number of times in my life, and I've had had things either fall onto my desk out of the sky, or sometimes they're handed off to me in different ways, but uh, a, um, a, uh, a detail, a, a, a temporary job at Fort Scott National uh, Historic Site up in Kansas uh, exposed me to Henry Strong's story. And uh, I was up there working a candlelight tour and uh, Arnold Schofield, who was the historian up there for many years, he's retired now. He, uh, he mentioned that they had a copy of a diary of a Kansas soldier who spent most of his uh, duty in Arkansas. And he asked if I'd like to read it. And, and that's uh, how we got here. Um, I read it and I spent some extra time up there on my own photocopying the whole thing. I brought a copy of it back to Fort Smith, the whole journal. Uh, we used it for a number of years as a reference uh, to kind of understand the Civil War in Fort Smith and, and, and learn more, especially about the federal occupation. But uh, and then I, I ended up going back to school to get my master's, and it, it seemed like the perfect fit for a master's thesis project, and, and uh, that's what it became. So, uh, and then after graduation, uh, I shopped it around a little bit, and, and uh, sure enough, was able to get it published, first of all, through the Butler Center down in Little Rock, which you're familiar with, and, um, and then the Butler Center's publications eventually got turned over to UA Press, so that's who's actually taking care of it now, but uh, that was a that was an interesting process. Uh, Tom Dillard was actually the uh, director at uh, the Butler Center in those days, so I worked closely with Tom Dillard on on this project, and that's a that's quite a, an experience in its own right, right there. So, and I was uh, I worked actually for Tom Dillard when I was a student at University of Central Arkansas when he was the archivist there before he left to go to right. the, uh, awesome. the Butler Center. So yeah, we've got a lot in common. Sure it's, enough. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, you know, one of the questions that you could ask is what, uh, you know, what does Henry Strong have to tell us about the Civil War? Um, I'm, I'm going to paint some broad, broad brush strokes here and, and talk about the big picture, but then I'm also going to talk about some, some uh, details too that he, that he gives us because it's probably on, on both of those levels. First of all, it's a, it's an enlisted soldier's diary, which, which, many times are somewhat rare uh, in the war in general and especially in the Western theater. So to have an enlisted soldier's perspective versus an officer's, which we have more of and more memoirs and things that are written by people in power and authority than we do the guys that were carrying the muskets and actually doing the fighting. So that's, that's one thing that's really special about it. Uh, a second thing would be that he, he probably was writing this for his own purposes. I don't think I don't think he had any aspirations of creating some kind of uh, record that would uh, be be published or be looked at or examined by anybody other than probably him and his family. And he was just trying to kind of keep track of where he had been and what he had been a part of and, and what he was seeing uh, in this great experience called the Civil War that he was involved in. Um, he actually started it a little bit late. Uh, his first few entries are kind of behind and he kind of catches up over a period of weeks. And then he, then he writes almost uh, regularly day, day by day 
uh, through most of 1863 and 1864 and 1865. So it's a, but, but some of those entries are very short, but they still are very rich in, in detail and names that he mentions and, and things like that. So, so the, uh, the fact that we have an enlisted man's perspective, and one of the things that, that right off the bat that he really uh, hits home is uh, the war in the West, the, the federal soldier's experience was, was comparable, uh, in, in my opinion, as a historian and an author, uh, to what, what the soldiers were experiencing back East. And that's something that's kind of been debated. Um, the, the question has always been, the, were, the, were the federal soldiers west of the Mississippi as disciplined? Were they as well-equipped? Were they as uh, uh, polished and, and uh, you know, trained as the soldiers in the Army of the Potomac back East? And, and from what Henry Strong discusses and the amount of drill, uh, the fact that they wear dress uniforms with white gloves at times, that they... Uh, all the stuff that they do, uh, we even have photographs of them and they're wearing frock coats, not, uh, not the uh, cheaper uh, mass produced sack coats of the, of the era. That kind of tells you that they're, they're, uh, th there's a little more to this than what historians have originally kind of assigned. So that's, a, that's, that's some of the main value kind of broad brush. He, um, he's an eyewitness to a lot of the uh, African-American troops that fight for the Union in Arkansas. Uh, he sees the first and second Kansas colored regiments uh, often. Uh, he he shares the field with them uh, at at uh, down, down at Jenkins Ferry. They're they're involved in activities around Fort Smith. So uh, so he sees firsthand, and he write, actually writes some perspective on on um, on the colored troops, and that's that's an important perspective. Another thing that he is involved in is he he uh, he fights against Native American troops that are fighting for the Confederacy. So. Uh, he has a perspective of that also, and those are things that a enlisted uh, white soldier in a uh, in a regiment back east wouldn't have wouldn't have encountered in the war. So that's that's kind of special and um, and and adds to the uh, I think the historical value of the uh, of the diary. Um, go ahead. Do you have a question? Well, I was just wondering. Uh, you know, he comes from Kansas to Arkansas, and he's mm -hmm. he's. Uh, and a lot of places here in Arkansas, you know, Fort Smith, um, he comes to, he's at Little Rock at one time, he's part yeah. of the Camden Expedition. Yeah. Um, he sees a great deal of Arkansas. Did he write about the geography of Arkansas compared to Kansas to back home? Did he make any comparisons or, or talk about that in any way? He he does because he's he's not uh, he's not riding uh, in a wagon or or in a, on a train or uh, in an automobile like most of us would travel Arkansas. He's walking it, so he he talks a lot about the geography. He talks about the difficult terrain in places. He he they march across the, uh, the top of a portion of Mount Magazine, and he ends up in Boonville for a, for a little bit of time. He, he's down at Danville. He mentions Danville by name, Ozark. Uh, Frog Bayou, which is where Alma is located today, and he talks about Van Buren and Fort Smith, of course, but um, they, they march down from Fort Scott, and they enter northwest Arkansas from, from the northeast corner of Indian Territory, so they kind of skirt, skirt that, and they march down, and this is, in the, this is uh, just after Christmas in 1863, and, uh, and they get to Fort Smith right before New Year's, and there's six inches of snow on the ground, and, and he, he says very clearly, we marched across the Arkansas River because it was frozen solid oh, wow. and we drove our wagons across the ice as well. So uh, his comment is, uh, it's, it was a rather rough introduction to this sunny land. That's what he writes in the diary. So the, so the title of the book is actually his, his first uh, you know, main observation about Arkansas. And I don't know what he was thinking if he was picturing beaches and palm trees and Warm, uh, warm climate, but it was cold and snowy, and and uh, and the river was frozen over. So it was a lot more like Kansas than it was like Arkansas in his mind. So. Well, and he was. They were probably thinking we're moving south, so it's going to be warmer, right? And yeah, he was not that far yeah. south, but he he was shocked. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know that that is a that is an interesting part of it. He he t he's out in the conditions. I mean, he, he's living in a tent. He's living. You know, he's sharing a a tent. He has half of the. The traditional, he carried half of the tent with him, and he had a, a, a messmate, a, a person he shared the tent, other half of the tent, and they buttoned them together, and they both slept in there. Uh, he talks about sleeping in the rain. He talks about, you know, uh, bad weather conditions. Then he talks about some good times, too. Uh, there's times when they're not getting enough food up the Arkansas River. That, that speaks to uh, 
the fact that the Federals had control of the population centers, but they didn't control much of the, of the surrounding landscape in 1863 and 1864 and even probably even early in 65, um, there was still a question of who was in control. And the river, if the river dropped down, they had a difficult time getting supplies to Fort Smith by wagon. So uh, Confederates uh, were pretty much aware of what was moving across the countryside. So, so he talks about being on half rations at times. Uh, they weren't doing fatigue duty or anything. They were just laying around camp because they couldn't burn any calories because they, they didn't have any food. So he, he talks about a variety of things um, that affect his, his uh, daily life as a soldier. Um, did he, you know, we know that uh, soldiers had opinions about their leaders. Did he write anything about the leadership of, in his unit or overall? You know, that's, that's an interesting thing. That's something I looked for, obviously. When I, when I read the diary the first time, I was really interested in his perspective. There's only a couple of instances where he's, uh, either somewhat critical or he's, and I don't know that I would call it critical, but he does point out some of the confusion that leadership causes for the guys in the ranks. And, and uh, the, the one instance I would throw out here as a story, I mean, he, he is, and this is amazing. It's amazing that he's involved in this, but one of his, one of his uh, diary entries or actually a couple of them are centered around his, his duty as a guard of the steamboat J.R. Williams. And the J.R. Williams was a steamboat that, that left Fort Smith and headed up the Arkansas River towards Fort Gibson, which was another federal outpost at that time. This is in the, this is in the spring of 1864. And he was, a, he was one of a 25-man detail uh, that, that was supposed to guard the boat. The boat had 16,000 pounds of bacon on board. Wow. And they were taking this bacon to Fort Gibson because they couldn't they couldn't put it on wagons and it, it would not arrive there. The Confederates would stop it and, and seize it. So they thought maybe they could run up the river and get it there by boat. Well, they get to about Weber's Falls, right just before Weber's Falls. And he says something peculiar happened. A shot rang out and it hit the, hit the smokestack on the steamboat. And the steamboat captain, the operator of the boat, drove the boat to the north side of the river. And he said the shooting obviously occurred on the south side. And he gives a real detailed account. But to make a long story short, they jump off the boat. And they jump into the tree line. He, he, they didn't even have their shoes on. He said, we were laying back on the deck, you know, enjoying the landscape and the scenery. And next thing you know, we're getting shot at. And uh, they bail off the boat. And they think that they've got the boat on the north side of the river. And they can hide in the tree line and be protected. And they can protect the boat. And he said, then something strange happens. The steamboat captain drives the boat to the south side of the river. And um, so he, he assumes, well, maybe that guy's pro-southern pro or something. <laughs> so right. there's something going on here. And, and what happens is there's a question of, is the major, there was a quartermaster major on board who was in charge of the shipment. And then there was a, a infantry officer, a lieutenant in, on board in charge of the detail. And they get into a big argument about whose fault it is. And Strong doesn't really, he doesn't really weigh into the argument, but he, you can tell he's got kind of an opinion about it. And he, he thinks that that quartermaster is not really doing his job, but, um, but that's about as far as he goes. He's not very quick, critical about the leadership. Uh, he kind of just calls it as he sees it and, and as a, as what happens to him every day. Well, now I'm curious, did the bacon get to Fort Gibson? Well, the the uh, the bacon got to the other side of the river where it fell into the hands of of uh, the Cherokee Mounted Rifles uh, commanded by Stan Wadey. And they liberated that bacon in the name of the Confederacy and the Cherokee Nation, and they distributed it to homes uh, all across the Cherokee Nation. And mm. then they burned the boat down to the waterline and sunk it. Uh, Strong and his guys, the 25 men detail, they ended up hiding in the bushes in the daytime and then sneaking the 50 miles. They were about 50 miles up the river from Fort Smith, so they had to go back 50 miles on the north bank of the river dodging Confederate patrols uh, the whole time. And he said when they got back to Fort Smith, they could see debris from the steamboat floating down the river. <laughs> so, oh, wow. So you know, they, didn't have much, they didn't have anything to guard at that point. They watched it burn and they, they watched it sink, so that was that. Uh, Stan Wadey got promoted to Brigadier General as a result of that uh, capture of that boat, by the way. So that's kind of a cool story. Well, then he make, makes his way down uh, as part of the Camden expedition. That's correct. Is he yeah. part of Thayer? Is he part of Thayer's group that meets Steele? He is. He's part part of Thayer's division, which is going to meet Steele, and they're going to they're going to march out of Fort Smith. They're going to they go through Hot Springs, which we uh, we identify one of the. One of the neat things, uh, we're, we're going to talk about Ed Bars at some point here, but, 
But one of the things that Ed Bars was surprised to learn is that there was uh, the Federals had erected a pontoon bridge across the Saline River at, at uh, near uh, Hot Springs, and he didn't know that. I mean, and Ed, Ed Bars found out something in the Strong Diary that he did not know existed, and that's amazing. I mean, if you know Ed Bars, for him right. to find out something he didn't already know, he, he mentioned that to me, and he said, I didn't know there was a pontoon bridge there, but Strong clearly says we crossed a, crossed a pontoon bridge, so that was, that was neat. But um, yeah, he ends up with the, uh, the Frontier Division, which is uh, Thayer's command, and uh, they take part at Jenkins Ferry. Uh, of course, you got Prairie Deanne, you've got Marks Mills, you've got Poison Springs. Uh, one of the things that he points out uh, in the diary, he writes an entry, uh, after Poison Springs, the drummers of the 12th, which is his regiment, um, he says that... Uh, I think we so that the uh, so that the dispersed drums all night long so they could they could find out where they need to be. Um, that's okay. that's kind of rich, but yeah. You might want to uh, say that again. You kind of cut out for a moment. So okay. back back to where uh, you said that he uh, he was at uh, right after the Battle of Poison Springs. The drummer. Yeah. So one of, one of the probably most significant things that one of his diary entries uh, about the Camden expedition. There's actually two things I want to point out. One is that that he mentions that the drummers of the 12th Kansas Infantry played played their drums all night long, beat their drums uh, so that the members of the colored regiments who had gotten routed and, and pretty much dispersed over the battlefield could find their way back to Union lines. And he 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 knows that they've been massacred and and uh, and there's you know they're hearing stories of the atrocities that have occurred down there. The other thing that he mentions in that in that uh, in that in that series of battles is at Jenkins Ferry, he makes the comment that uh, he said, today, we got a good long look at them. That's, that's how he says it. And, you know, you, you got to keep in mind, you know, our, our concept of the war would be the blue and the gray and these soldiers lining up on the battlefields and seeing each other every other day and, and fighting. Well, they didn't see the enemy very often. And, and sometimes it, they might be shot at, but they might not see who's shooting at them. So, and especially in Arkansas, lots of bushwhackings, lots of small unit tactics like that where people were hiding behind things. So um, the fact that they lined up, walked across the field and, and the Confederates were right there opposite and they were looking each other in the eye, that's that's kind of significant that he mentions that in his diary. He doesn't say that very often. Right. And, and you know, as historians will, uh, will point out, the Camden Expedition was a failure for the Union, but Jenkins Ferry was probably the only one of the few right points of, a, in fact, um, still is credited with one of the best defense of in that battle, defensive positions and holding the battle and, and allowing the basically his army from being routed by yeah. the, destroyed. He was able to uh, win that battle and then retreat uh, back to Little Rock intact. Interestingly, though, Henry, Henry Strong talks about that retreat in detail. And he says, we burned our tents, we threw our packs down, we, uh, we got out of there with our lives, and we ran back to, uh, to Pine Bluff, where we got on a steamboat. And he, he reflects riding the steamboat back to Fort Smith on the river. He said, we're just glad to be alive, because it, it got pretty bad. And you could tell, you know, he, he, he writes with a, he writes very, I wouldn't say emotionally, but you can tell his tone and and uh, those entries. You can tell he's pretty tense at what he's just experienced, and he was definitely glad that they survived that. and And uh, I think he understood that it that they they might not have. So that's a that's that's a real interesting section in the book. Well, you know, it sounds like anyone who is and a lot of people are obviously are interested in Arkansas history during the Civil War that he gives of some very good information uh, mm -hmm. about. Uh, from a perspective of a of a soldier, of an enlisted yeah. person, yeah. from from the from the war, um, where does he after the war? What happens to him? Is he mustered out in Arkansas, or does he he, uh, he he gets transferred from Fort Smith to Little Rock, and he mentions getting his picture made in the diary, but I have not been able to locate the picture that was taken in Little Rock, and that's that has broken my heart, you know, because I was hoping to find that maybe someday. Uh, but he goes, he goes from Fort, uh, Fort Smith to Little Rock, Little Rock to Duvall's Bluff, because that's your marshalling area for the, mm -hmm. for the federal army. And, uh, and then from Duvall's Bluff, he is mustered out, and, uh, and then he rides a steamboat to St. Louis, 
uh, and from St. Louis, he gets on a different boat and rides to Fort Leavenworth. And then from Leavenworth, he walks back to Mound City, which is in Southeast Kansas, not, not too far from, from Fort Leavenworth in the Kansas City area. So that's how he gets home. And then um, he goes back to Mound City in 1867, he gets married. Uh, his marriage photo is, uh, was given to me, a copy of it by the family. So it's in the book. So that's a picture of him in, uh, two years after the war. Uh, with his lovely wife and they look you know if you've seen the book they look so happy like all those 19th century wedding photos you know right. they have this, you know they look like they're in pain actually but uh, um but he he uh he runs a mercantile store and uh he has a mercantile store in mound city for the rest of his days and and does real well his wife is the librarian at the public library in mound city and and they're well-known pillars of the community and um uh, I'm not sure what year she died, but I know he died in 1927. So, do we know um, if he ever did he ever visit back to Arkansas? Come back. Yeah, not that not that I know of. The family the family was not aware of anything uh, like that. The interest the real interesting thing is, uh, and you talk about legacy, and you talk about you know the people that came later. Um, the when I when I chose this as my master's uh, project. Then I had to I had to find out a whole lot more about it than I ever dreamed I would I would know. I mean, it was more than just a resource. So I went back to Fort Scott and found out who donated that copy of it. Uh, from that person, I, it was a it was a distant cousin down the line, and from that cousin, I traced it to direct descendants of Henry Strong, and they're the ones who actually had the original diary. And um, so I contacted them because here's here's the here, this is a this is important to understand. I had a uh, I had a typewritten version, a, a typewriter version of the diary that was done by people from Kansas, and most of the Arkansas places and names didn't translate to them very well because they weren't from Arkansas. So they so I could tell what they were talking about. They were talking about a place called you know, like Cave Hill, but it was actually Cane Hill, you know, things like that 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 were recognizable. And uh, needed to be corrected, so I needed a copy of his original diary in his handwriting, and the family gave that to me, a copy, and then I made my own translation based on that. I kind of looked at what had been done before, and I looked at the original, and I, I came up with my own translation, and that's what's that's what's published. But in that, I got to meet two descendants, and one of them uh, had she lived her whole life in Kansas, and and that and she she had a neat story, but she was elderly by that time, and and the her cousin who was also a direct descendant. He was actually a retired uh, Apollo uh, NASA engineer, so he had worked on the Apollo projects. And he had a, he was from Arizona, but he drove all the way to our, uh, to to Kansas and then then down to Arkansas to meet me and, and and present me with a copy of it. The diary was later presented. The original diary, the the diary, uh, was given to Fort Scott later, and they they actually brought it to Fort Smith and let me see it while I was a park ranger, um, so that I could actually you know handle it and touch it and look at it. But then they said, you know, we'd like to give this to Fort Smith because a lot of a lot of this stuff happens here. But he said they said he's from Kansas and we just think it ought to stay in Kansas. And I I, I totally understood that. But it was it was neat to meet them and and uh, and talk with them about his his uh, story and his legacy and, and what we can learn from that today. That's awesome. And give us the full title if you would of the book. The the book is called A Rough Introduction. To this sunny land, the Civil War Diary of Private Henry Albert Strong, 12th Kansas uh, Company Company uh, K, 12th Kansas Infantry. And, and you can uh, pick yeah. it up at all of your online locations. Yeah, it, it's on Amazon, and then you can probably the fastest, quickest way would be to get it from UA Press up in right. I have it at UA Press. It's actually in a second edition too. The uh, the Civil War sequicentennial years, which happened a few years back. Uh, they they actually reprinted it and uh, and changed the cover up a little bit, changed the photographs. I, I did want to mention that um, I'm not going to I'm not going to pull those photographs up. But one of the things to look for in the book, there's a series of photographs that came uh, outside of the Henry Strong story, which were pretty interesting. But but uh, a, a photograph collector in Portland, Oregon, contacted the National Historic Site in Fort Smith while I was still working, and. Uh, he believed this gentleman collected photographs. Believed he had some photographs of World War, of, uh, of Fort Smith that were taken during the Civil War. So I, this is back before you know scanning and email. I mean, there was email attachments, but we were we were in the infancy of the internet and digital photography and everything. But anyway, he got 
digital images made of those pictures and he sent them down and uh, and then he and I got on the phone and and so he obviously had pictures of the garrison at Fort Smith the barracks building which later became Judge Parker's courthouse and jail uh, he had pictures of the officers quarters building which burned in the 1870s he had pictures of the blockhouse it was it was definitely Fort Smith from a couple of different perspectives you can even see the flagpole on the parade ground oh, wow. and then he had some then he had some pictures of some soldiers lined up on a city street. Well, the buildings in the background, even though the negatives were reversed and we had to reverse the negatives, if you reverse the negatives, you could read the names of the businesses that were in those buildings. And one of them was the Bostick and Pennywit Mercantile Store. Uh, Bostick and Pennywit are two businessmen. Bostick was from Fort Smith and Pennywit was from Van Buren. And they had a store on Garrison Avenue. So we knew that those were Union soldiers standing in front of a building on Garrison Avenue. And then there was a series of those and they were labeled 12 Kansas, 13 Kansas, second Kansas. And that's all they said. So, so we knew, and then, you know, knowing, but they also had dates on the back of the pictures. We ran the dates and compared to what was going on in Henry Strong's diary. And sure enough, Strong says on that day, we stood on the main street in Fort Smith and waited for General Heron to inspect us. Oh, wow. So they were on review on Garrison Avenue in Fort Smith, and they were waiting for General General Heron of Pea Ridge fame and Prairie Grove fame, for that matter, uh, you know, to to come down and, and inspect them. And they've got white gloves on. They've got their frock coats on. You can see all that in the picture. So we got a picture of the 12 Kansas. I don't know which guy is Henry Strong, but we've, we've got a picture of him in the regiment standing well, on, on the streets of Fort We know Smith. he was there, though, thanks yeah. to the diary. Yeah. That's interesting that you can actually, you know, when you discover something like that. Yeah. What other, you have a lot going on uh, in addition to your teaching duties. I know the, uh, you, you said this spring, the, uh, the um, Drennan Scott historic site is gonna open back up. Right. Um, what else you've got going on? Well, we're, we're actually in the middle of an Arkansas natural and cultural resources uh, preservation project right now, funded by ANCRC, and uh, it is it is the home of Leonard Wilhoff, and Leonard Wilhoff was a German immigrant to Arkansas in the 1830s. He was a Mexican War veteran uh, during the Mexican War, and he actually carried the flag that the Van Buren Avengers, a company of soldiers in the Arkansas Mounted Rifles who served under Archibald Yell at the Battle of Buena Vista, he carried the flag for that company. Uh, the flag was sewn by the ladies of Crawford County, presented to those soldiers before they left for Mexico. And um, interestingly, it's a property of the old State House Museum today. So the one Mexican War era flag in the collection at the old State House uh, has ties to, to the man who built this house that we're preserving in Van Buren today. He's buried in Fairview Cemetery. And the house is actually adjacent to the Drennan House, it's right across the railroad track. So it's included in what we call the Drennan Scott Historic Site. Uh, so we're going to we're going to open his house. We're going to cut the ribbon and open his house officially this spring in March. And we're also going to reopen Drenham Scott, which has been under under some repairs and things we need to do while this COVID uh, situation has been hanging over our heads. Uh, so we'll be back in business for those two things and get those properties opened. And, and we'll be dealing back with the public. We do a lot of different programs at Drenham Scott. Uh, you and I were talking before you started recording, but Drenham Scott is a uh, amazing historic site in its own right. Uh, John Drennan was a uh, was a uh, an ar early Arkansas politician. He was a businessman. He owned land in Chico County, about a thousand acres of cotton, and, and he was uh, he was connected to a lot of people that we know of in Arkansas's history. People like Albert Pike and and Archibald Yell and and um, oh uh, Solon Borland and David Walker and and all of those guys were. A part of, of uh, his experience, but then he was also good friends with uh, Sam Houston, and he was friends with James K. Polk, so he was connected all the way, all the way to the top. Um, in that, he um, he he built a small empire, but he died of yellow fever in 1855. But then his family kept passing down that property, so we have a property that includes five generations of of American history: uh, slavery, the Underground Railroad, um, uh, the Trail of Tears. Uh, military service from the American Revolution all the way to, uh, to Vietnam uh, is, is represented by the family. Uh, the World's Fair in 1893 in Chicago, the World's Fair in 1904 in St. Louis, 
those are all things the family were, was involved with over the years. And um, it's just a really rich place that is a snapshot of American history and Arkansas history on a lot of levels. So that's, that's what keeps me busy in my spare time. Well, I promise when, uh, when you reopen, I'm going to come up and visit you. I'm very <laughs> excited to learn about that history. I, I, for some reason, when I worked up in Fort Smith many years ago, I don't ever remember hearing about the Drennan well, Scott historic. I mean, those that days, so. Yeah. In those days, the family still owned it. And I heard, I mean, I was local. I mean, Fort Smith and Van Buren, I've been, I've lived uh, significant my whole life on both sides of that river. And I had heard of the Drennan Scott house, but I had never had a chance to go see it because the family really had kept a really tight uh, control of it. And, uh, and then some things changed in the family and they, they decided they might want to see if um, some kind of institution might take over. And that institution ended up being the University of Arkansas, Fort Smith. Right. Well, again, Tom, thanks for uh, being with us. Thank you for sharing the life of Private Henry Strong. Uh, I would encourage you all, if you want to know more, get the book. It's If you are a, a, someone who's interested in the Civil War, especially in Arkansas, I've ha I'm halfway through it. I haven't I tried to get tried to get finished before we before we had the interview, but I only got halfway through it. But it's it's fascinating. I've learned a lot about this Civil War from you know his perspective and and really a, a Union soldier's perspective. Yeah, it it is a great record, and uh, we're we're very fortunate that we we can uh, we can learn from it. Uh, here, all, all these all these years later, we have a a, a great picture of the federal experience in Arkansas. So. I appreciate you letting me do this today and enjoy, enjoy talking with you, Shane. You too. And we will uh, catch you down the road. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you.